Okay. Uh, what I'd like to do, uh, first, let me, I got to orientate to the prior speaker. So I do, I do feel myself, and, and even more so after that comment, well married. So I think I'm okay, and I do validate the importance of that. I think sort of all humor aside, it made it certainly resonate with me. I liked hearing the point about technology for productivity and efficiency. I love following a discussion about talent. What I'm going to talk a lot about today has a lot to do with talent at all levels and in all parts of the organization. And let me ground where I'm going in what I think in many cases for large infrastructure is in fact the ultimate purpose, the reason we built it in the first place, and that is to deliver an experience. That is an experience for the guest or the user, but also an experience for the operator or the employee who has to live and work in that and deliver the performance associated with that infrastructure. So I'm going to try to tell you a story about great experience, experience performance in an airport, which is a pretty tough hill to climb for most of us. I mean, we can't even imagine seeking that out as a place that we would like to go for a great experience. I get it. So on behalf of and with uh, three parties together, McKinsey, uh, the Greater Orlando Airport Authority, which operates the Orlando Airport and, and a small executive airport, and a part of Disney that we collaborate closely with called the Disney Institute that focuses on guest and employee experience with Disney's rich background in operating obviously very, very large infrastructure. For example, the Orlando Parks and Resorts being the largest single site employer in the world, which has no less than 17 unions operating with its environment and billions of dollars of capital infrastructure that serve people every day. So we took a look at, uh, spent the last several years in an ongoing process, the Orlando Airport is an interesting place to challenge how far you can you go on experience and with a, with a set of infrastructure today and coming forward in the future. And Orlando is an interesting place to do this and to take on this level of aspiration. Orlando is a large airport. It's not in the top five, it's in the top quartile. Uh, it has 18,000 people. It's what we call an origin and destination airport. It's not a hub, which means it has all kinds of airlines coming in from all over the place with many origins and destinations behind that. So for example, it's Virgin Atlantic's largest site outside of New York. Uh, it's the number two site for Southwest. It's the number two uh, or three site for United, Delta, America, and whatever. It's a very rich site. It's the largest site in North America for Hertz on the rental car, car side, et cetera. It's a very rich, diverse operating environment. What makes Orlando perhaps most interesting and challenging as an infrastructure asset is physically where it sits. It is in ground zero of high expectations for guest experience. And probably also if you understood the behind the scenes story for employee expectations. It sits in the middle of an environment that is dominated by Disney, Universal, and SeaWorld where every single person entering that space has very high expectations having just come from or on their way to, which are even higher expectations because it's, it's magical dreams at that point, about what they're about to encounter and what they expect and what they need to have in that experience. So if ever there was an environment where you would set an aspiration to put yourself onto an undeniable trajectory as the absolute world leader in guest experience, where it's almost in fact mandated as these big operators and these millions of people every year look at you, perhaps Orlando would be a good place to look at that. So as we approach their 40 million annual passengers, their 18,000 people, by the way, only 300 of who, whom actually work for the airport authority. The rest of them work for over 60 different organizations as diverse as Delta, Hertz, Virgin, Westfield Malls, janitorial service providers, the Orlando Police Department, and our dear friends at Customs and Border Patrol, right? So it's a very rich environment to look at this. And when you look at a trajectory for developing experience in, in an infrastructure asset like this, it took on for us and it's carrying on a sort of a three-tiered approach that grounded itself to the left in who is that customer really and what do they really value and what do I really need to provide for them because at the end of the day that is actually the only purpose of an airport is to deliver a great experience. How do I then translate that understood and increasingly strong guest and employee experience into related operational and commercial performance because now I have a North Star understanding of what actually matters and who I serve and what I should be doing and how I can generate revenue and operational performance. And then what's very exciting for us in Orlando and is in many large infrastructure situations, there's a next horizon of capital and infrastructure coming. In our case, it's a $2.2 billion terminal expansion that is now in the early design phase with an integrated intermodal terminal, a high-speed rail coming in from Miami, et cetera, et cetera, in this same context. 
So now we have a, a spectrum, a journey view of how we're going to drive performance and that performance process grounded in experience. So let me give you the answer up front. Does it work? The first question is what, what matters? How do you define performance? Experience is something we all intuitively believe and certainly if you live and work in Orlando, you of course believe that experience is the key. But what benefit does it really drive? So what if I improve experience? How do I measure it? How do I know? So the, thing, the five points on the left are the ones that we have been looking for. We look for revenue lift, right? Because for example, revenue, rental cars are the number one source of revenue for that airport and for many, right? So we look at, at the re rental car performance. We look at the retail, the food and beverage performance. We look at the related operational efficiency now much more accurately guided by a better understanding of the customer. We look for route competitiveness. So for example, in the last three months, not without its own related controversy, we landed a flight in from Dubai on Emirates, right? That's a big deal for the city of Orlando. That actually is much bigger than just connecting to Dubai, as many of you know. It's connecting to an entire piece of the world, right? So that competitiveness for those routes depends on not only having a great experience, but also being an authority and an agency that you can work productively with. We look for how we align future capital productively and effectively and with high performance going forward. We have new terminal, we have capital investments in the terminal that we have. And of course we look for the related regional economic development which we all believe in, we know and we have to serve, although in some cases much harder to pin down. Does it work? Well, in the last year this airport made the single largest ever jump in customer experience rankings of any North American airport ever. Six points from number 11 to number five in one year. We'll look forward to where we go next year. So that's one indicator. There's an objective source that says something's happening, right? And we like to see that. Now, that's great. Does that translate into anything that we can measure or better yet, put in the bank? So actually just a few weeks ago, the Orlando team just looked at retail performance year over year from last year. And they corrected for volume, they corrected for domestic and international passenger mix. International pa passengers spend a lot more when they go through an airport like that. And they corrected for retail mix. So with no actual increase in volume, no change in the product mix, no change in the retail source mix, this airport's delivered a 16% increase in year over year retail revenue, which is pretty cool, right? I mean, this obviously funds that airport, it drives performance, it makes it a more attractive place to have better operators want to be and spend their time and make their investments, right, going forward. We like to see this. And we've seen the same thing on employee rankings. So how do we do this? And I would argue that an airport with its diverse operations from life critical flight operations to retail to janitorial to police and security, et cetera, is a pretty mixed up place. Uh, the good thing about it is just about anybody can find something in there that's interesting to them. It's also a complicated space because my 18,000 people work for all these different organizations, some of whom have fairly strong views about what they want to do. Delta Airlines, very strong view. Virgin has a very strong view, so does Southwest. So it's not like we have a control authority over the people that actually operate and run this building. So how do we get at this? And it's loaded with opinions. Well, of course, you're going to expect to hear from us that some facts are helpful. Um, when you start any of these things, you get flooded, as you know, with an enormously rich set of things that must be fixed, none of which are supported by any facts whatsoever. And the more senior the person is, the more likely they're to, to, to exhibit that behavior. I absolutely know that it's the color of the carpeting in these rooms that's driving everything. If we could just change that. No, it's absolutely TSA lines. That's the single biggest thing that's dragging down this airport's potential performance. And I'll show you that that's actually not true coming up. So what we did is we actually looked at the vertical axis of many different factors that might drive experience. And think about this, and we're, and we're doing the same for the next terminal coming. What drives CSAT or customer satisfaction stores? The X horizontal axis is how important is it to the actual guests that we know? So what do we find when we look at this? There's all kinds of things we could work on. We're not bad at most everything. We're fine. I mean, these are sevens, seven and a half, eight, whatever. We're actually not wowing or distinguishing our experience on anything that actually really matters. That's the honest way to look at this picture. So the upper right is completely blank. We are not providing a distinctive experience on anything that is clearly actually mattering. And you can't believe in the last year how much time we have spent talking about restrooms, right? Because we now have this picture. It really, really matters. 
So we start looking at the things that do matter that, and that we can actually do much better on. And this gave us and can give anyone, frankly, with the right lens, a much more factual basis for actually deciding where to focus. It also helps untangle all the competing views and perspectives about what matters. It helps to align 60 different organizations in a way that they perhaps couldn't have into something that Disney would call a common purpose. So this becomes our roadmap to how to move out. And let me show you one example of what matters. When you approach this situation, and there'll be hundreds of these examples in any different type of infrastructure project, it was absolutely clear to everyone at the start that the wait time in the TSA line is what matters for everything. If we could just fix that, we'd be fine. Meanwhile, TSA, and, and having been a Defense Department government employee, I have my suspicions about the government's point of view, but the TSA is actually saying the wait times aren't that bad. They're sub 20 minutes. That's the target we have. Of course, nobody believes them. The louder they say that, the less anyone will listen. So we go and actually measure those wait times because we have to put this issue to rest. So we take thousands of people, we watch their actual transit times through TSA, and we give them iPads at the end over many days and weeks and months and ask them to rate their actual satisfaction with the overall experience of the airport. And what we're looking for is, you know, there's gonna be this clear correlation. And what you get is a very helpful and almost classic curve. Below 20 minutes, that red line to the right, there is virtually no difference in the satisfaction. It's okay, it goes from 9.1 to 8.1 or whatever. It's fine. Spending money, which is what we were about to do, to shorten the TSA lines below 20 minutes is an absolute waste. It is a very inefficient way to drive any form of experience. Now when you look at what's underneath this, do those TSA lines matter? Absolutely yes, but it's not this. What matters when you looked at the rest of the scores and the other things that were, people were looking at is number one on the list was the perceived conduct of the TSA officer. Number two, the perceived visual appearance and therefore related infrastructure space as I approached that line. The perceived conduct is very important because and I, we could tell lots of stories about this. What happens in this particular airport, and think about design and how it interfaces with behavior and therefore experience and expectations. I have, first of all, had a maybe terrible experience checking in at a long line in an airline before me. And if I now think about myself as an interconnected community of 18,000 people who actually deliver together, the fact that I had a bad experience in the airline before me means there's no way I'm gonna feel good about standing in another line, even though it's not my fault at TSA. The next thing that happens is I've walked past a food court where, if you know the truth, understandably, I saw TSA officers eating lunch. I roll into my stereotypes and I'm now clear that they're actually eating donuts because that's what they do as law enforcement. Of course they're not. I then approach a line and I see what looks like a line because the layout has big elevator banks in the way that makes it hard to see. And then I'm confused even more. And now I think back and say, those guys are all sitting back eating lunch back there and they're not doing any work, right? And then there's more and more layers to that. So the perception of behavior and conduct was really funny in Orlando because in Orlando, Disney has people stand in 20 minute lines all the time and everyone feels great, right? We'd never feel that way in a TSA line. So getting the facts and understanding what's behind it is much more uh, important. The last thing I wanna close on, and this, there's a story behind this that goes all the way to the board meeting. So we inevitably, when we approach something like this, we come up with hundreds literally of ideas that drive great experience. The absolute number one idea that the board of directors in the airport all the way up to the governor of the state of Florida has keyed in on is not all the infrastructure improvements, which are important, and all the technology, which trust me, there is a ton of it going in. Uh, it's the conduct of the employee. Imagine a world where 18,000 people can exhibit those five behaviors on the right. My personal favorite is make eye contact and smile. Imagine a world where when you walk into an infrastructure space, you have set up an employee experience, you've set up training, mindset, compensation, recognition systems, everything to actually deliver a workforce that can make eye contact and smile. You will have a great experience even if we mess up the signs, regardless of the color of the carpeting or what kind of plants we put into the lobby, and we do all those things fairly well too. So thinking back to that employee experience foundational to that guest experience, absolutely critical as we looked at this experience. Okay.